thanks everyone for being here. We'll start um, kind of talking about, well, the whole session will be based on referral strategies. Um, we'll talk about some business development teams uh, and just how to increase the, the overall sales at your clinic. Um, if you've never been here before, this is really open space. You can you know ask any question, uh, no questions too basic. If you're, you know, don't want to ask, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, I know everybody submitted some questions beforehand, so we'll go over those as well. Um, but yeah, this is just an opportunity to meet other clinic owners, directors, therapists, you know, ask about the business side of things. Um, if you've got something not related to referral strategy, that's fine too. Um, we'll have some time at the end to, to go over um, more questions, but feel free to be off mute. Um, this is supposed to be interactive, so um, go ahead and ask away. There's usually a lot of good, good uh, conversations that go on here. So, hey, Kristen. Um, so let's start here, uh, Justin and Ben. One of the questions that we got throughout a lot of the submissions was, how do I, you know, get a, get past the front desk initially at a, a doctor's office? How do I get to the right person, the decision maker, um, you know, that sort of thing initially if I want to build a partnership with them? So, Justin, if you you want to start there, and then Ben, obviously chime in wherever. Yeah, absolutely. So first. It's important to understand every office is, is different. Um, there's still big offices that we have a hard time getting past the front desk. We've we've had a full time business development person going going there for three three years. So I think it's important to to keep notes and and really your goal should be to understand the dynamic of of how that office works first. Um, and before we even started there making calls, you know. And the reason why we hired someone full time to start doing this was because I realized very quickly that it's it's not my strength. I started going there and and you know, hit a couple front front desks that were that were very tight, and they they you know you know wouldn't let us in, and and it and it's very discouraging, and it's a huge waste of your time if you if you can't get past that that front desk person because no matter how many at times you say. Hey, here's my cards. They're they're taking it, and it's not getting to the right people, and they're not changing their behaviors and how they send send patients. So, um, but the first thing we did was we we took everybody and we said, "Does anyone have any insiders in these companies? Like, did you go to high school with anybody? Did you, you know?" And we started going through all other websites, reading all the bios of this, this, the staff, if you can create any small connections, it, that's all it takes to, to get your foot in the door. So we were able to probably locate four or five different connections that we, that we had with the big orthopedic offices. And we just started with Facebook messages or text messages, just saying like, Hey, we would love to do you know, lunch with you guys. Let us know. And, and you know, there's a lot of offices now that looking back after three or four years, actually it's, it's probably over five, five years now, um, that said, we don't do lunches. They just say, no, no, it's okay. We don't, we don't do lunches with any salespeople. Well, guess what? We're doing lunches every quarter with every single one of those groups now. So it's it, those, their answers that they do are very scripted and, and they will, will, they will say things because they think that they're doing their doctors and their staff a favor by pushing you away because they're busy and they don't think they have have time for you but it's important to try and figure out if there's anything you can do to help them so so you know it probably takes three or four or five drop bys and introducing yourself before the person actually knows who you are and then you can start asking pointed questions like Hey, just, you know, one quick question for you, you know, who is in charge of sending the referrals out? Does it come from the doctor? Does it come from you? Does it come from one of the PAs, the nurse? If you ask a specific question where they can give you a specific answer, I found that they'll usually answer you. And then as that happens more often, and, you know, especially if you drop them off an iced coffee or something like like that you know you're you're doing something nice for them and and in exchange for that they're going to answer a 30 second question for you but if you take that information and you go back to your drawing board and you start to lay out your map for that office after four or five ten of those calls then you have something figured out enough to where 
maybe you can get that first lunch with that that doctor's office. And what you know we've done is made sure that our lunch is memorable to where to where we feel like we earn the right to ask another question or two. And and we just over the years have chipped away at that. I wish I could come out there and say that there's some magic you know, the thing to, to get past the front desk, but there's not. Um, it just takes consistency and it takes thoughtfulness and it takes strategy. Um, but the last thing I'll say is, is also, if you act like a salesperson, you're probably gonna get stopped as a salesperson and they're gonna say no. But if you can go in there with something clinical, so if it's, a, especially if it's something that's gonna help save their butts so like hey i have a patient that has this wound that's borderline I wanted to show doc this picture just to make sure or you know last night i actually had a patient who called me and said that they were discharged home and because their surgery got postponed because because of of hurricane helene uh their pain medications were being held up at the pharmacy so so I was actually able to like reach out to that doctor via their, you know, their after hours phone line and get them to call me back and, and got that problem solved for that, that patient. Well, doing stuff like that is what's going to get your foot in the door and you're going to open up the relationship and, uh, and exploit it after that. Ben, any, any thoughts on, on your end as far as just yeah, getting past that front desk? Yeah, I think, I believe everyone here has been in business long enough, and I think just even if you haven't, just listen to what Justin said, you know, it is not necessarily a great return on investment chipping away always at front desks um, for all the reasons laid out. So I've pretty much all but abandoned that strategy for maybe five or six or even seven years now, where if I do go in or have someone go in, you know, strategies I'll deploy is, one is I think the clinicians going in to meet with the doctor is a much different discussion than a business development person going to meet the doctor to get the initial part of the relationship established. So I'd rather pay my therapist a lunchtime to go out to these physicians based on referrals that we receive that the doctor may not even be the primary referrer, but maybe like a secondary referrer that you know got it from the primary, but they have an ortho. And I'll go have my therapist go in and um, it seems to help with the credibility of I, I'd like to speak with the doctor rather than business development where they're just quickly to kind of say, well, you know, thanks for buying us a cookie or thanks for bringing us a milkshake, but no thanks. But, but the reason I ban abandoned it is it comes down to like value where if I can't show the doctor that I'm going to bring them a value really quick, it's really tough to get that relationship to be a two way street. So one is I'll track referrals that I'm sending out. Like, let's say there's a new ortho group that has two or three new docs in it. I'll make a concerted effort to send them patients. I'll track how many I've sent, I'll get their names. And it's different when you show up and say, you know, he, I'm, I want to speak to the doctor. These are the 11 patients I've sent you in the first, you know, month that you guys have been open. I'd like to have a deeper conversation how I can direct more business here. It's real, it's tangible. But more so than that is, going back to what Justin said, is I'd rather find someone in the community I have a relationship with, a prim especially a primary care, if we're talking about orthos, primary care rheumatology that I do have a relationship with and say, hey, you know, have you ever met Dr. Toman? And they'll say, no, I've never met Dr. Toman. And it's like, you know, I've been in there once or twice, but I'd love to introduce you to Dr. Toman because you, the primary care, can bring him business. You, you know, you can, you can see your patients, but I'd like to go with you so that there's this network that we're building. And I try to always go in the concept of a network so there's value. And then, then if I do go in and see Dr. Toman, it's, hey, you know, when's a good time for me to bring Dr. Smith and Dr. Jones over from the primary care practice two doors down from you? We'd like to quickly talk to Dr. Toman is there time for lunch or time after work and we can all meet? And it's a much differently re received thing than, hey, I want something from you. It's, I'm bringing you value. You know, these physicians already trust me. I see their patients. We want to build this little bit of a network together. How is it different if I show up now with two primary care docs who are five doors down from the ortho? And the answer is it's very different. So I, I haven't knocked on a door of a, of a primary care or an ortho in quite some time as just like a cold call. But when I did, my strategy was also, you know, never negatively market someone else. I think mean, that's a really terrible, you know, thing to go in because it just looks bad on you. You know, oh, don't send to, you know, so-and-so's clinic. They're awful. I would always go in and say, 
you know, who, who do you use for your physical therapy? And oftentimes they'll say someone's name and I'll be like, that's great. They're really great. You know, your patients must be getting great service. But once in a while, there'll be a patient who's not happy. They don't take their insurance. They can't get them in on time. Do you please use me as number two? And it's a very non-confrontational thing because you're not even asking to be their number one. Can I be your number two? And it seemed to resonate with people in the beginning. Like, oh, yeah, I'll make you my number two. And then I usually stick them with something to remember, which is like, even if it's not true, meaning like, I don't only specialize in shoulders, but I'll say, you know, we, we only really do shoulders. We're awesome at shoulders. Like, send us your shoulders. And then it just sticks like, oh, Ben's my number two person and they do shoulders and it sticks a little bit. But I think to start this conversation, we better to say, how do we know that anything we're doing has the ROI? You know, I think we're talking about a B2B strategy, which is we're going to referral sources. We want to spend the attention to turn on that faucet. So it's an ongoing, of course, there's maintenance of an account, but there's ongoing referrals rather than direct consumer, which can get you referrals. But it's just a matter of how much time, money, and effort that I spend, and it all comes down to can you track that? You know, if you can't track it, I would say it's really scary to do any sort of marketing, sales, or advertising if you haven't set yourself up to track what's the outcome of what you're doing, just like in therapy. I'm going to get baseline reading. I'm going to do some intervention, get a, get a follow-up, and that's going to help me steer whether that intervention was good. The one thing I'd say is, you know, how much did it cost to do 20 knocks on a door? There is a cost to that, especially if they're not fruitful. Um, Versus if it took 20 knocks on the door to get a relationship that took 12 months to then steer to get 10 patients, I would still want to know what was my cost to get those patients in the door and can I track that? Am I tracking to see how many times did I knock on Dr. Smith's door to get a Dr. Smith patient? And then the reality is, is it worth the ROI or would have I been better spent doing Google AdWords or would have been better spent doing some sort of other business development or health fairs or something more direct consumer? I am a big believer in the B2B side of it. Like I believe that it's, in my experience, very cost effective to turn on a faucet and maintain the faucet rather than hunting and packing a patient at a time. But I'd also say one of the best things to do is if someone fell in our lap that I know we got from someone we haven't had in a long time and I know they use someone else and, you know, how, hey, how, how'd you get here from Dr. Toman? He doesn't refer to us anymore. And it's, you know, oh, you guys are just closer to me. You know, that patient becomes your best advocate where if you let them be your best advocate, they really can be. I will literally say like, hey, I you know we don't get patients from them anymore. It'd be awesome if you could help us out. And especially, I mean, if we got them better and they're happy. Um, could, can you really just, when you go in, please make a point to say, I saw Ben, the therapy office was awesome. I know he's a little bit further from your office and other therapy clinics. If you have people live out this way, I can't recommend it enough. Cause then you've bypassed the front desk. It's a meaningful interaction with the doctor and they'll start to remember. So, you know, the, the comment of there is no magic bullet getting around the front desk. I mean, that is the truth. And they are doing their job of, you know, they'll get scolded if too many people start walking back kind of thing. But I think showing up at a doctor's office unannounced, unscheduled, is just not fruitful. It's different when I now have their phone number, direct contact. Hey, Dr. Hirsch, I'm bringing in these two rheumatologists to meet with you this afternoon at lunch. Are, we, are you going to be around at 12 or 1? Yep, both work well for me. Okay, I'll text you when I'm in your lobby. It's a much different encounter than knock knock here's a copy or i noticed that you have a you know university of south florida poster in the wall my son went there you know those are all things that help and work and they're better than nothing they're good strategies in marketing of trying to find something relatable but but i really think it's just bringing value you know and the value can't be the commodity which they think you are it can't just be i do physical therapy and i'm good well you know all nine of us on this call or how many are on the call probably knock on the door saying the exact same thing so like what made you different Maybe it's an insurance you take that someone doesn't take, or maybe you tout that we only do one-on-one -on -one care, or maybe you tout that we're open on Saturdays. You know, man, I, that's great. Good to know. And good to remember. So, so I don't know if I actually answered the question, which I'm thinking no, that's, for not doing, but no, no, that's that's perfect there. And I, I think it's worth noting, like Justin so, and Ben have, like Justin's got a full-time business development person, business development team. Ben doesn't have a full-time business development person, so it's different strategies. Both are effective. I'm going to drop a link here just so everyone can listen to it at some point. But Justin gives basically a step-by-step -step guide on his referral strategy that he uses for all seven of his clinics. It's definitely worth listening to. Um, Kristen, go ahead and ask your question. I think it's worth just getting your getting that out there and, and kind of seeing what people think. Yeah, thanks. This is my first time coming to one of these, but I know Katie. She was my old, she's used to oh, be nice. my boss, <laughs> so that's fun. Um, so I have a remote team. We do telehealth only, and so these are cool suggestions when we live in person. Close by can drop 
you know, drop by to the physician in town, but we, you know, I'm in Massachusetts and we're in seven other states too. So what do I do about these physician practices in Texas and in New Hampshire and in Florida? Like I can't go. That's, you know, it's hard for us to communicate to these teams. We, we usually can't get past the front desk on the phone and I totally get why, and they won't hand out email addresses and I get why. Um, one thing, one thing we've tried, which we think is cool and the physicians asked for, but has not really gotten a lot of response in practice is a clinical report. I'm going to show it, but it doesn't, doesn't show you a whole lot, but we track outcomes in a software portal that we designed and we fax this along with their like, you know, reauth request. Um, but they don't respond to it. <laughs> so my, I work in, uh, that's our Ben, you go ahead. I was going to say, I work in a national platform, and I, the one thing I'd say is you'll hear probably over and over again from other people in the industry, just healthcare is local, and it's very hard to compete when there are local relationships. You know, the kids play on the soccer team together, whatever. You know, it, healthcare is very local, and there's no ways around that other than recognizing it, and either playing into it by finding someone who's boots on the ground and can help a little bit. But you're also selling orange juice when everyone else is selling apple juice. You know, I, I think it's... I think it'd be different if you were trying to come in from a, I also sell, you know, I'm a national chain and I'm trying to get someone to buy into my national chain in a local market, but you're, you're, you're national or regional national, but you're selling something that most people aren't selling. So I think, I think then, you know, if I just said as, as a pure first gut reaction is, I don't think your sell is to the doctors because I, I think now your sell is direct to consumer because it is you're trying to make the consumer yeah. aware that. There's yeah. orange shoes over here. You could go through all this and do all this stuff, but I've got orange shoes over here. You may not even realize the health benefits of orange shoes. So, so I don't know that I don't know that your play is to go to the doctors and get through the front door and get them aware of your product as much as the consumers. So we do advertise to consumers, but each physician that you know, if we need a referral, each physician has more patients. So why not? You know, like we're we're advertising to the consumer, but. If we have to interact with their doctor, that's also a sales opportunity to get. So well, without that, and, and that patient becomes your sales right. opportunity for sure. Right. Yeah. So I, I think that the biggest issue that, that I would see with you, Chris, and I would guess based on my experience is that because, like Ben said, healthcare is local and everything like that, that you might have a patient that you reached out to you and you spent the money to land as and them as a perspective then when they go through the process of going through their doctor or the orthopedic surgeon whoever they end up getting stolen by their processes of sending to somebody else because they have other stronger relationships if that's happening then i would say you could call them and ask for a logistical conversation say hey especially if you've treated their patients because they found you you can call and say we already are treating your patients I just want to make sure that our information is properly set up in your EMR or your system that you send the referrals to. That way, when we do get your patients that we're, we're treating, that there's an open line of communication between us and the doctor so that if anything happens where we need to reach out to you about the patient's care, we have that 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 portal open. And, and I've had good mm -hmm. success with that conversation because it takes a lot of I've been told no before to that, but most of the time they'll be like, if I, I can't say no to this, the person's just asking to make sure that if something goes wrong with the patient, that the patient doesn't suffer. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think that would be a good strategy and just sure to make your setup in their system so that and then, and, and then maybe later on you chip away at that relationship to where the end all be all goal would be to have your marketing material staple to their cork board right there that says for mm -hmm. patients that want telehealth send here, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. That would that would be perfect. Yeah, that's super. Um, but I would say in, in in general, everyone's different. So I don't think I know Ben's business is totally different than mine. Uh, I'm saying what you know what yeah. what has worked for us. But I and I think that our seven clinics. I mean, we're not a big company. We you know, but but I will say that based on our efforts, I could say I'm just looking at our our our, our data we, now. We receive over. Uh, we receive over um, fifteen hundred referrals from our top ten referring doctors per per year. So um, 
And before we started this, I had data from the guy that I bought this company from who didn't do any physician marketing heavily mm -hmm. at all. And we and and top right. 10 referring doctors were a fraction. You know, we got maybe 30 referrals from our top. We had so many different doctors, primary cares, and everything. These, these top doctors are all that we bear with those that really got in from when anybody we started. So when you talk about an ROI, I can look back and say, I get 1,500 referrals a year from just our top 10. And we track our top 50 now. So, um, I mean, that, that, that right there is a huge ROI. Jerry, did you feel free to chime in, Jerry? I, I, I kind of let you got it. You're good. Okay. <laughs> um, one thing I did want to cover, well, first of all, anybody have any questions on, you know, what questions uh, Kristen just asked um, or anything that Justin and Ben had? Anybody have any, anything else to add there? Yeah, I, not necessarily to add, but, and, and again, maybe it's just uh, jumping ahead in line, but I, I'm curious because there's a lot of platforms out there that um, try to sell you on. If you use our platform, we'll get you whatever the platform is. It might be AdWords. It might be that they do cold calls. They've got a website. You know, again, staying on what I said, which is, you know, it's worth it's worth trying something to track the outcomes. Like, don't set yourself up for failure. Don't pay. I, I talked to someone once. He's saying I'm paying twenty thousand dollars a month in advertising. And I said, you know, how do you know if it's working? He's like, I have no idea. I'm like, well, that's like, that's crazy. Like, what if it's working great or what if it's not working at all? Like, how, how, what are you measuring it against? But I'm curious, has anyone used something, and whatever that something is that's not homegrown, has anyone used something that they've gone, wow, that was a really good return on my investment? You know, some, some whether it's a marketing campaign, someone who said, you know, I found a really good person with SEO. Does anyone have something that like, I measured it, and boy, that was a surprisingly good return on investment to get patients in the door. We've done A and B tests on on um, advertising on Facebook. That's been amazing. We serve stroke patients, same as Katie. Um, so we, you know, advertise on Facebook, and we've had way more success with a video ad than a static ad. Just. And what's your what's your call to action there, Kristen? Just to, to like our up? intake form, intake yeah. form, or call us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. I think a lot of it depends on on your on your patient payer mix too. I mean, if if you're heavy heavy Medicare like us, um, we found that going directly to the referral source eliminates some barriers. Um, then you know we've we've struggled you know with going direct to the patient because then the patient doesn't have a referral or, or you know, hasn't seen their their doctor in a while and the doctor won't sign the plan of care. So, you know, there's, there's issues with the direct access. So I think if you're in a state that has more direct access or, or your you know, most cash cash base, it, it changes your dynamic totally. Um, so I, I, I think that it, that's an important conversation to, to have too, when you're thinking about investing in a you know, direct to referral source marketing program. Kristen, out of curiosity for Facebook, did you compare it to other forms of digital, like, Google or anything else? And have you found it to be your biggest ROIs on Facebook? Are you yes, targeting like than neuro, neuro support group? Are you, are you doing pretty targeted as far as geography or is it targeted as far as like- Geography, yeah, geography, age group, um, that you can't get so specific on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. I said, the last time I checked, it wasn't ultra specific, but I didn't know if yeah. it got better. Yeah, but that's where we get the most, that's where we get our highest, um referrals we'd like them to come from like each each person then needs to bring the doctor with them <laughs> you know like and let us go up up the chain that way um and then we have clinical we have partnerships too that you know like groups that serve similar folks and like try to get referrals through them but that that we do have a person on a clinical partnership type of person with us because part-time you know yeah tom i'm curious uh I know you've done a lot of stuff with different corporate companies um, in New York. Will you maybe just speak to some of the, the partnerships you built? Um, yeah, sure. So I've done a ton of B2B when it comes to health fairs or even in, in office uh, ergonomic sessions or, uh, by the way, I'm also a chiropractor just for anybody out there. Um, so my model is a little bit different. We 
Justin kind of touched on it. We have a lot of direct access. Um, so that's a, a really big benefit for us, especially in New York. Um, so I've done a lot of going directly to HR for benefits coordinators and setting up either whether it be employee appreciation days or where I bring in massage therapists or we set up lunch and learns or ergonomic assessments, things of those nature. Um, we always have to get invited to their annual health fair, um, which is always the D to C always works pretty well. Uh, and that we've done it. It really depends on your capacity for this. I've done it for smaller companies, um, particularly when I was first getting started in practice was showing up once a week at an office and, you know, just treating through there. Um, they would set up a room for me and I would just be able to treat there. And they actually, there were some companies that had budgets for it. And so that was a great way to diversify some of the revenue, um, which was pretty awesome. But that's very, that, that's something you really got to have the capacity for. A, a bigger company, I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, so you got to make sure you can actually deliver on what you're selling the company. But uh, that's been, those have been pretty helpful things for me. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, Tom. Um, Tanner or Jack or Alexis, any of you guys have, have any questions or have any success, you know, doing particular referral strategies or marketing strategies? If not, there we'll, we'll jump to another, another question here. Um, Christian, I think you had submitted beforehand that, and correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but that you guys get, you know, about a hundred leads a week, but have a hard time kind of converting them. You're doing scripting, recorded calls. Um, but maybe just struggling a little bit on that. Do you want to speak to that? And then I know Jerry that you're, you're really the specialty on the, the front desk side of things, but, um, if you want to provide more context, Kristen, that'd be now awesome. you have my attention. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. yeah. I mean, what we're doing is disruptive, you know, like neuro rehab is not usually done virtually end of story, right? Like that's, it's very unusual. There's some other, there's some. MSK players like Ben, obviously, you know about that, but, um, you know, so people, people just, it's so confusing to them, the idea that they could do telehealth for neuro that they're like, I can't even, can't even imagine how this would work, but the patients that we do have love it. They make amazing gains. Therapists are happy. Patients are happy. Doctors are happy. We're making money. Everybody's happy, but convincing more people that they could do it is really hard. Yeah. Jerry, give me your give me your thoughts. I think you're, you're still on either. My okay. thoughts, Jerry's first. Um, you know, I don't think there's any convincing to do. Personally, I don't like that word. For the record, um, I think there's questioning, there's acknowledgement. I think you have um. You're right. And so your biggest leverage point is right. But oh, hold on. Let me back up. Here, here's the issue I have is I right. People are finding you, people are connecting with you, people are clicking on something for a reason. Right. Mm -hmm. So so my my only feedback to this is I'm trying to process a little more what you said is I think leveraging, I don't think we do this well enough with Facebook ads, with Google ads, with even MD referrals, right, on the front end of, you know, why us? Why now? And I think you could build a conversation around that, Kristen, because again, so much of what I learned was we have to ask better questions up front and not assume anything. And then you have the leverage. I'm going to jump ahead probably a couple steps. You have the leverage of happy paying customers to then maybe create some kind of video or conversation right that you can continue with these people mm -hmm. and i think the most important thing is to say right why did you click this is interesting right facebook ads i always tell anybody when you pick up the phone from a facebook ad your first question should be why'd you click on it and people take it like a regular sales call and i'm like well it's, it is a sales call but we have to know why why us why now what is your drive what is your motivation here so i think i said the same thing over and over but <laughs> no, Just it's helpful. About this as we go. Yeah. And so, you, you know, it's interesting. And 
And you said disruptive and innovative, and, and that's right. And I don't think that means people don't, well, I'd say they're not quite sure what to expect. So that managing and setting of expectations is ginormous in that group. Right? The biggest we, mistake we make in our profession is we schedule people for physical therapy. I get it every day when I do secret callers. They schedule me for physical therapy. What's physical therapy, right? So I tell people don't sell physical therapy. And if anybody's on the schedule for physical therapy, you're probably going to lose. So just some thoughts there around the sales process. That's Good. a good point. point. What, um, what do you find, Kristen, is the biggest reason why people would want to do do their their stuff with you virtually? I mean, what they don't like it because they like filling in the day off? It's part of it. They I mean, it's they it don't or... like it. It's that it's hard for them. You know, most of them don't drive. They've got to take public services to get there or they they're you know 45 minutes away from the specialist that does this work and so you know that's transportation is part of it but the other part of it is they've all tried before like most of our most of our patients are not like post post surgery like a lot of you know your kind of traditional is like you had an operation now you need therapy for it that's not what we do we do like chronic neurologic care so they're they're finding us because they've done therapy and they're five years post stroke and they're still impaired and they're like this is it this is my life i look like this now forever so like we're taking those people and saying we should try it a different way try our way you know and see if see if it's a different experience for you and and that's not the that's not the scripted message but you know that's kind of the overarching complaint we hear is like i did therapy i didn't really get better and now i'm discharged and like they told me this is it so we are trying to intervene then and offering something different. So do you find I, out what that past experience is on that phone call? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And sometimes I mean, they're in therapy. You, yeah. You know, the other thing, let, and I'll be quiet here after this. Um, I, I think something that's really important is, is we can't, we can't look at the first phone call as the sales process, right? It's ongoing. So maybe what I'll throw out to you, and I've done this with people right before is, um, that first phone call is just a step in a process, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe, and, and I don't know, maybe I should ask you, is the objective of every phone call to get someone scheduled that day? Or do you guys have a process in place if someone says, I'm not quite sure, and you hang up or I'm yeah. uncertain? We offer screening. We send them an informational email afterwards. We have like other information that they can view after the conversation. Based on where that conversation goes and where yeah. it ends, you're saying yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I think that's the bestest strategy for this because, right? They're they're in this world of this unknown of why now, why me, right? Well, is it right? There's a lot of uncertainty, and uncertainty is what kills the sales process. Uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Right. And I could see it huge in your world. And so how do you put together? Because to me, the best selling is the testimonials. Current yeah. patients like them. Right. So, hey, Kristen, um, just so you know, we have and I'm going to make shit up here. So don't hold me accountable for what you do versus what I say. You know, we've helped a lot of people five years after stroke get back to mm -hmm. not function, not wh wh whatever they said they want to get to. Yeah. And then say, would you be interested in reading more about the people we've helped or hearing from the people we help? And then sending that them that specifically, right? Right. And looking at it as more of like a two to three step process to get someone. Because then at that point, this is what I love. The deeper they go into your process, the likelihood of them arriving, paying, and then completing a course of care goes through the freaking roof. Mm -hmm. So the time, energy, and money invested in one more call, one more call actually increases the likelihood of the desired result. Because they get to, we, we do try to have, we have a team of several intake coordinators and they, we try to have the same person follow up. So they recognize the name. Oh, it's, oh, it's, you know, Vanessa calling me again. Absolutely. So. I, I am. But it is, I think one problem is that like it's a random number that people reach out to us and then we call them with a number they don't know a lot of them just never answer they never answer the phone call are you we, talking about the facebook leads yeah oh but that's that's industry norm okay that's that's okay. industry norm so many of them yeah, just never I, answer the phone I, by the way what is your what, what do you know your conversion rate for all facebook leads 
not good. <laughs> not well, enough. I don't know. It's, well, well, it's, like, it's never enough. But you yeah. realize, I mean, I figure 30% of Facebook leads. Remember, these are cold people. Yeah. Right. And, and we have to look at this. If someone calls you, right, Kristen, you know, if someone calls and says, hi, my name's yeah. Jerry. I'm calling because mm -hmm. a past patient of yours told me to call. I'm like, we're done. Let's right. Yeah. They're converting. Yeah. They're coming in. But a Facebook lead, I'm like, right. We have to, that is the closest thing to a cold lead. They're not cold, mm -hmm. but that's the closest thing to those people have to be nurtured. They have to be taken through a longer mm -hmm. process. And by the way, yeah. if you get 30% of those, I, I take a step further and say, again, because I've worked in change management, both from a clinical side, but more so on a patient side, especially in the virtual care world and uh, in multiple countries. So it's you're you're selling something you know is proven, like you've got the data and you've got the happy customers. And like you said, you've got a very um, cynical, dismayed population you're dealing with because they've been told by people in the therapy clinics over like, You've maxed out. I can't bill us. You know, they're they're kind of already a little cynical. This is probably deep diving into this more than we probably should on this call, but it's a um, it'd be it'd be it'd be almost an interesting business model where you strike out the credibility problem and then make a sale. Meaning, what if you had a renowned? I mean, you're up in Massachusetts. What if you grab an MGH neurologist, a high pollutant yeah. therapist? and someone else and you do a and you do targeted webinars to you know stroke survival group kind of thing invite them mm -hmm. now they and they hear that i've done this here's a research shows it works i've heard it from these leading experts i now have credibility and it's not to jerry's point like i agree a, fa a facebook ad google ad it, cold isn't even the right word i mean you don't even know the motivation the motivation could be just pure it's 11, it's 11 at night, I'm bored, this ad just caught my attention, I was curious to see if the human was there. It's, mm -hmm. It may not be relevant that they're even looking for the sale, yeah. where maybe if you break down the credibility barrier first, that you know exists, you know that there's credibility, but, but again, I think even if you pulled 100 physical therapists and said, do you believe that a virtual neuro program can work? You probably get 99 saying no, mm -hmm. um, maybe 100, depending on who you ask. <laughs> So, so you know that the cards are stacked against you because anyone yeah. they hear from around them, family members, members of their family might be in the medical field. They're probably getting a lot of like, that's hogwash, don't do it. Because, you know, in 2019 and 2020, when we were trying to do virtual stuff, um, we got to say, like, how could you possibly recover my knee virtually after therapy? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, you know, there's a lot of data that shows it does. We, we've got 900 patients. I can show you the data that, you know, but it's different because I don't have to sell someone on virtual care because it's, it's enough around that I don't have to make that credibility sale first. I, now I can just say, here's our widget, do you want to do our widget? But I think because you're so early to market, you're gonna have to make that credibility sale at some point, maybe first, or for some patients, like Jerry says, listening to them what their barrier is, like the first call mm -hmm. is really a discovery call and going on from there. Yeah, I think we maybe we don't phrase it as discovery call, but I think that we, we even people that are getting therapy are like are you getting better do you like it is it meeting the needs or do you still feel like it's not it's not what you're actually so we we actually convert people away from their in-person care a lot of times because they're like i'm not getting better it's the same thing every time or i sit at a i sit on a new step the whole time or like that's not real therapy <laughs> you should be doing something else well um anyway i don't want to derail the whole call but this was helpful I, well i know i i think it's important here though it it's not it's not one stream. So I, I think we do a poor job in healthcare of understanding all this. You have coming in the better for the business. And then you're not dependent on one thing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, we do. I'm fully behind physician marketing because I believe it's the best word of mouth marketing you could ever possibly do. Um, but I would argue you do all these things, but here's my bias. There has to be a sales process for every single one of these spokes coming into the hub and your sales team has to understand how to manage this process and move these people through a process that gets to the result that is best for them. And so Facebook leads, yeah, going to take a little longer. Ben's, Ben's idea, those people are going to probably turn into, right? Bigger, bigger time, money, and energy investment, at least on the front end, not long term, right? Those are going to be 
different leads that still go through the same process, but an increased likelihood of arrival is higher off the first phone call. But everybody is a lead. If someone initiates a conversation with you, mm -hmm. right, they should never be out of the system and they say, stop bothering me, basically. I want to get to Katie's question. Um, Jerry, she just asked, how do you share experiences of previous patients, connect them to the patients directly, written reviews, video testimonials? What do you? So honestly, all the above. And again, where do they fit in the process, I would argue, right? Begin right? P people choose people they know, like, and trust. And they nobody wants to be the first. That's the other thing, Kristen, you're dealing with. Nobody wants to be the first, right? Telehealth, neuro, I've never heard of this. I've never seen anybody else do it. So this social proof versus individual proof mm -hmm. has to be played out. Um, again, it's, you know, it's the marketing and sell side. I just think, um, I, I, yeah, that's all. So yeah, Katie, all of it. And what works best, this is the other thing, what works best for the people you're serving, Katie? Katie, did you want to ask, um, I know you had submitted a question just about how do we get the long line of patients waiting for speech therapy services off the local hospital list and onto to ours. Do you want to just maybe expand on that and, and ask everybody? Sure. Um, so we are a clinic-based outpatient OTPT speech targeting stroke and brain injury survivors. And we're in the Triangle in North Carolina. So we have Duke, UNC, and Wake Med are our big hospital systems, and they own everything. And their systems are designed to keep people in their system. So patients go through the acute hospital, they go to inpatient rehab, they get discharged from rehab, and they will either do home health or outpatient. And then they go back to that same hospital system for their physiatry follow-up visits. And it's real easy for those physiatrists to just refer right back into their own system. And it does not seem to matter that these hospital systems, that it can take weeks to sometimes months to get in for an in initial visit. And then even after you have your initial visit, it could take weeks for a follow-up visit. But physicians still are not referring people out. And so I know that there is weeks to months long waiting list for speech therapy in the hospital system. I can get people in the same day. I'm sorry? And to be filled out three times the amount per visit that you're doing. Well, right, exactly. Um, and so when, you know, when people can find us, when they can call us, it it's an easy sales pitch. You know, they they almost always choose us over the hospital because of the value that we offer um, and the skill that we offer. But it's getting them to find us. And so, you know, so, putting- soapbox, we, soapbox here. And again, I'm not pretending what I'm about to say is easy, but I, I've lived in areas of the country where I've had that dynamic. I, I know your area of the country very well, and I can only, like, I wouldn't set up shop. And that, I mean, that's just a brutal, that's a brutal thing that you're, you're dealing with, but you're there. You need to make it work and you're making it work. So when I hear this, and again, I, I look at things very differently than most people do because I'm involved in some other stuff. When I hear what you're saying, like your your play, and if you don't do this in the next 18 months, I'd say I'm gonna come up there and root for whichever blue and white team that you don't like to, to beat your blue and white team. But um your play has to go to the payer. You you forget getting referral, you have to go to the payer because you cost you cost 76% less than those mm -hmm. hospital systems are charged. And, and you're able to see, so they're concerned about how quick you get on my patient, timeliness of care, outcomes and cost. And you're gonna beat Duke and Wake and all those on all of those fronts. So like, it's crazy to me, just hearing this, I'm just saying it's crazy that you're trying to compete with their referral loop that is heavily incentivized to maintain that referral loop. In fact, they get, I know docs, they get penalized if they break the referral loop. Um, but if you went to, and it's tough because there's wake, there's insurance plans that are these health systems have insurance plans. They are insurance plans. And I'm not naive to that either. But there's some in your area that are not uh, those health plans. And I think if you went to those actually payers, and maybe it's direct to employer type self funded, which you've got plenty of those in your area, or maybe you go to the Medicare Advantage plans in the area that are not sponsored by Wake or Duke or something. And you explain what's going on and you show them the difference in pricing between a 
because you're on the physician fee schedule, most of these hospitals are not. They're on the hospital physician, the hospital fee schedule, which is significantly different, especially for speech, significantly different than what's being billed in an outpatient clinic. And I think if you sell them on the timeliness of care, in fact, if you build in KPIs in those contracts and say, we guarantee every patient will start within 24 hours of call, that's when you may have to unload virtual care to, to meet your KPI metrics. But we're, we're going to get people, people in quick, they're gonna have good outcomes and I'm gonna be cheaper by at least 30% and I'll bank on that. Now you have the insurance company steering your people your way and they say, at this point they'll say, you know, Katie's a network, this is where you can go and you've got your $35 copay or no copay. Um, but if you want to go to Duke, you can. I mean, wonderful name behind it. Um, but it's going to be $150 deductible or copay and a $13,000 deductible. And finances do steer people away from the closed referral loop. So, again, I think we're getting into stuff way deeper than probably what this call is armed for. But I, I would say that knowing your area um, pretty well, uh, you you are in a very difficult spot if you're trying to break those efficient position loops that are so embedded in how those doctors actually get paid how those facilities like that's such an embedded nepotistic thing you've got there that i would i would leverage what you've got to sell which is quality care one-on-one -on -one, you know all the stuff they're going to name and cost and timeliness of care i'd go sell it to the payer and just get out of that. that that to me seems to be your sale more than Barking at the front door of a physiatrist who's getting paid based on their leakage. They literally get charged on their leakage rate. And two, two of those, I know for a fact, those doctors get penalized on their leakage rate. Any any follow up questions, Katie, or or anything else you want to you want to chat through? If not, we'll we'll jump to, to something else. No, it's a it's an interesting thing to think about um, because most of our clients don't half the time they don't even know what their insurance is much less have had any communication with their insurance company as a means of directing them where to get their care so you know i have to think a little bit more about how that might actually play out um and because a lot of the commercial carriers have like fixed per visit reimbursement that is it's too low for what we can afford just based on our cancellation rate, because this population has a high cancellation rate. So we're out of network with a lot of insurances. And so, you know, does that make us cheaper than the hospital? I'm not sure, but it's an interesting thought process to work through and I'll definitely give it some thought. So thank you for that. I wanna go back, we've got about 10 minutes left here. Justin, have you had any success or if, you're, if you already have a strategy in place, in terms of developing referral strategies outside of the doctors, whether it's with chiros, personal trainers, gyms, um, you know, stuff like that. You're still, you're still on mute. You're still on mute, Justin. Sorry, we we have had some success. It's, it's a much smaller scale, so we haven't poured, um, a lot into it but i will yeah. say that it's a time thing and I, I think if you're active in the community doing what you can and i think if you're well net networked in your area it just the years that go on it gets stronger and it's hard hard to actually measure but, but like all you know all, all the clinics that we have, we've had that are more than five years old we get a lot of those kind of referrals and the other ones are starting to, so i'll just say you know i'll, I'll say be active and be, be vocal and and be and you know actually be visible i think it's a small business owner's curse that we think that if we're if if we're too visible that we're we're doing something wrong that we're doing something slimy you know uh you know whether it's out there wearing your shirts when you're volunteering or or, or it's important to, to to be visible and still be active um so that's our our strategy there, um, but it also, you know, is important. And you know, now that we're talking about it, that if you're spending all this money to get these referrals for the first time, that you're also spending money and having infrastructure to to stay connected with your patients after you see them for the first time. Because we spend a crap ton of money on that first referral, but it's much cheaper and much more efficient 
to have those patients come in two, three, four times per year, and you have all this repeat business because that's where your return's gonna come from. Um, and that has to be calculated into your system. So if you, you are just spending all this money getting it, but then not doing anything with it, then then, then you're just leaking leaking tremendously. So so you our spend the money strategy. and get, get the patients in and then stay in, in, engage with them and stay connected to them all the time. And um, that's why we we hired our full-time business you know, business development marketing person when we had two clinics. And we haven't had, we've scaled up a little bit, but we've opened now another five clinics and, and our payroll is still very consistent with what it was when we had two. And why and is because once you establish these networks with these doctors or, or your patients through other things, then you can move on to the next town or the next, and then and, and do that same thing. If your systems are in place to continue to capture those referrals and get their friends and their family in also. And it's, it's, it's a huge sales process. It goes from the front desk to men's to the ad therapists, you know, Hey, I always say, you know, manual therapy pays a little less and I'm not saying not to do manual therapy, but if you're doing manual therapy on your patients, I want you to be having the conversation with them on friends or their spouses. How did you find us? Like have these sales conversations with them to pass the time because that's our ROI on manual therapy is, is because the, those patients can talk to you while you're doing it and, and we can figure this out. So it's important mm -hmm. to, to do all that, that correctly. Jerry, give me, you're on mute there, champ. Yeah, that's right. That was my favorite part of this. Use the manual therapy as a sales process. I freaking love that. By the way, I'm manual therapy trained, so I love it even more. I did a I did a, a lot of outreach to physical therapy uh, personal trainers when I uh, first got started, just because that's kind of where my network took me. And and one thing I was really that worked really well for me was really kind of like the "what's in it for me" um, type of attitude with them was really you know if they have clients that are hurt, a they want to make sure that I'm not going to shut them down and blame the personal trainer um, because they don't want to be, they don't want to lose the client. Um, the other thing that also really worked was, hey, the, the longer that these people are hurt and injured, that's more cash out of your pocket. So the quicker you can get them in to see somebody, I can get them back to you and we can co-manage even like here, let's try not to do this, let's not try not to do that. And that has been a very successful strategy where it's the second somebody feels like a hamstring tighten up, they're in my office. and you know, that, that could be within 24 or 48 hours and then they, they don't miss a single session. And so sure. that's money directly into their pocket. And that, that's always been very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Does anyone have any other questions? We're going to wrap it up here. I'm going to toss a link here to our studio, our strata studios, all these guys, Jerry, Ben, Justin, Tom, uh, some other folks on this call have all been on the podcast. So if you guys want to hear each of their thoughts on, different things. Um, definitely check that out. And um, 